one of the things we know about poverty through years of research and one of the things that Extension is really trying to work on is that poor people tend to think that the world acts on them and people in the middle class and upper class tend to believe that they are acting on the world. There are many factors that influence our health. And believe it or not, much of our health outcomes have little to do with health care. In fact, it has more to do with how we live our lives, the people around us, and our family culture. According to the U.S. Extension Service, all of those factors and more go into what they say are healthy people living in healthful environments in healthful communities. On today's Sound Living, the role Extension plays in promoting health and wellness. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman. Kansas State University Assistant Professor and Extension Specialist in the School of Family Studies and Human Services, Bradford Wiles, says it's possible to look at family environments to determine if there are differences which contribute to optimal health or less than optimal health. The Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities has developed a framework of national health and wellness that's being delivered through cooperative extension in all 50 states. Wiles tells the K-State Radio Network's Richard Baker that extension is starting a focused push toward health, health disparities, and health inequalities. What cooperative extension brings is this more embedded, community-based approach to changing health outcomes. What the national framework really looks at is community level, family level, and individual level change, and also affecting policies, systems, and environments, really taking this sort of holistic approach to doing for health in the 21st century what we did for agriculture in the 20th. Is the health of the American populace in general so bad that we have to have a program like this? Yes. There are a number of indicators for the population in the U.S., and particularly in Kansas, I might add, where we need to really work on health disparities. So there's sort of the global health challenges that we know about. Americans struggle with obesity. We struggle with depression and anxiety in much higher numbers than other developed countries. But then particular to Kansas or to other Great Plains states, is, uh, there are a lot of health inequities. So and this is true across the U.S., but even more exacerbated in Kansas, your income level determines your health outcomes much more than in other developed countries. Your race or ethnicity also has some determination on your health outcomes. So how long you live, how healthy you are as you live that life, and how healthy your children are going to be and your family as you grow. And so what Extension has started to do is try to really affect health in all the multiple domains. So there's spiritual health, financial health, behavioral health, mental health, physical health, nutritional health, these kinds of things. And so we know each of those contributes to overall health and that in, in different populations, those things make more of a difference than in others. So, for example, if you took a Hispanic person and a Caucasian person – and gave them the exact same circumstances, same level of health insurance, same income, same housing, all of it. The Hispanic person would have a lower level of health and well-being than the Caucasian person on average due to a number of the social determinants of health, the things that cause you worry, how you're perceived, your access to different systems, your ability to navigate systems. Some of these things are cultural. So one of the things for sort of white middle class families is we get pretty well trained to navigate different systems. You know how to go to the DMV and get your driver's license. And it's part of sort of our culture for non-Caucasian families. Sometimes that's not part of what the training is. And so what ends up happening is you see discrepancies based on zip codes, even neighborhoods, uh, just small clusters of neighborhoods that have to do with different cultural components and their views of the system, as well as some of the, the ways that the system treats them in a more differential manner. When you say equity and disparity, what's the difference? Disparities have to do with the changes in the outcomes as a result of health inequities. So disparities are what you see at the end. So 
lower quality of life, shorter lifespan, more disease, more chronic disease. Inequities are the structural and cultural barriers to making those disparities reduced. So if you can flatten the disparities so that everyone has sort of a similar projected outcome given a diagnosis, then you've got essentially health equity. Unfortunately, currently, there are a lot of inequities. So if you get sick, your status has a lot to do with what your outcome will be, which is the disparity. We tend to measure disparities against sort of the dominant culture, right? So we measure disparities against white middle class people. Inequities exist for all different forms of who you are. So uh, I'll just take myself as an example. I am a white man. I am uh, 43 years old. And so I have a lot of things that are really going for me. So I'm Caucasian. People that are non-white tend to have lower health outcomes. I'm a man. That actually sometimes works against me in terms of my health outcomes. My life expectancy is actually lower than it would be for a woman. However, women have different factors that contribute to health disparities as a component of being uh, women. So oftentimes their uh, reproductive care isn't covered under health insurance. Oftentimes they don't have essentially choices on whether they use contraception or not. So in a lot of cultures, women who are married are unable to say no to their husbands and can't uh, use contraception. So they have 10 kids and those kinds of things. And so those are things that contribute to health disparities. These are sort of those social determinants of health that really factor into this notion of inequity and then disparities. And one of the things that we know through decades of research is that for people who come from more affluent backgrounds, the choices that you have in terms of availability of fresh fruits, vegetables, non-processed foods is much higher than those who come from lower social economic status backgrounds. That said, none of those things are the sole reason. So it's not blackness, although that does factor in. It's not income, although that does factor in. It's not gender, although that does factor in. On average, though, what we see are those individuals who face multiple inequities have disparities in their health outcomes. So how does the extension service go about dealing with race, with poverty, with gender? I think this is where it's really important for us to recognize how complicated these systems are and how important it is for us to consider all of the social determinants of health. And when I talk about the social determinants of health, we have research now that indicates that if you were fed really salty and high-fat foods as a child, you are likely to not be able to process those well as an adult, and you will retain weight longer, and it will be harder for you to lose it as a result of that. So it's important for us to tackle this from all of these social angles. So how are we doing it? For one, we're working with some colleagues at Kansas University Medical Center and the Kansas Health Institute to provide access to health insurance for families who, who already qualify. We're not working on Medicaid expansion, but trying to get families who do qualify to take advantage of those benefits. We have efforts around helping people get out and walk. So we have Walk Kansas. We want people to be healthier, live healthier lifestyles. There's a partnership with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation now that's just in its early stages, that's working on building what they call a culture of health. It's providing opportunities for good, healthy choices to be available and easy in any situation. This is long-term system policy and environmental change, and it takes time and effort and energy. So what we're doing is we're focusing on some poverty amelioration as well. That What we know about poverty is, is really fascinating is giving people money is not the solution to poverty amelioration. That, that doesn't help. People have tried that. They've, they've tried to give houses to people who are poor without the support for that, right? And what you end up having is a situation where someone has this really nice house, but they don't have the ability to maintain it or the skills or know-how to maintain it. And so 
what we're doing is we're, we're working through a number of different systems to provide mentoring, pairing them with not just one set of families from the middle class, but several to help provide support in terms of emotional support, openness to their networks, not financial support, not any sort of fiscal support at all. There's no handouts. There's no cash. It's much more about providing examples of how to navigate systems. So one of the things that middle and upper class families know how to do as a virtue of that upbringing is to navigate systems very well. So you know what questions to ask. You know when to ask for a supervisor, when to advocate for yourself. One of the things we know about poverty through years of research and one of the things that Extension is really trying to work on is that poor people tend to think that the world acts on them. And people in the middle class and upper class tend to believe that they are acting on the world. So there's this real shift in mindset. This looks like, to me, a nearly impossible task. Here in Kansas alone, we've got Kansas City, we've got Wichita, big cities. In western Kansas, we have the meatpacking industry. All across Kansas, we've got farmers. These are entirely different communities just in Kansas. And then when you move out to the rest of the country, how do you deal with these differences? One of the things that you mentioned that I had failed to to this point that is really important is rurality is also a good predictor of health disparities. I mean, obviously, right, you have transportation barriers, you have some isolation. So your point is very well taken. And the answer to your question is exactly why the extension model is so important. It is taking local level information and needs and bringing to bear the resources that those communities need. What we've learned through decades now of policy is that these blanket, top-down approaches tend not to work very well. And so what extension brings to the table is a much more bottom-up, a much more community-level, what we sometimes call community-based participatory research, communities identifying what their individual challenges are. So, for example, diabetes might not be a big concern in Western Kansas. Maybe it's aging in place, older adults getting older and wanting to stay on their farms. And so it's up to us then to be able to be creative and innovative in supporting those families because it's not just the individual who's aging that we're affecting. It's their family and their community. To your point around Kansas City, totally different needs there. For example, high African-American population. They have, by virtue just of genetics, of having different health disparities. For example, sickle cell anemia. And so how do we work with that? And the answer is we work with those communities and say, okay, it's up to you to help us figure out the solution that you need. You said it's impossible. It's not impossible. It is difficult. Make no mistake. If it were easy, we would have fixed this by now because we've, we've known for a long time that there are these health disparities and that there are health inequities. And when we're talking about health, health care is a very small fraction of health. Some estimates have it as high as 20 percent. Most have it about 10 percent in terms of the influence that the actual health care system has on your health. And this is the challenge for extension. We need to work across our different silos, early childhood, adolescents, older adults, as well as remembering that these are individuals' lives that we're playing with, that they deserve and need the supports that we can give. But we are not here to rescue anyone We are here to help them help them. That's K-State Research and Extension Child Development Specialist Bradford Wiles. He spoke with the K-State Radio Network's Richard Baker. More information about health and wellness is available at county and district extension offices and on the extension website, ksre.ksu.edu. Sound Living is a weekly public affairs program produced by Research and Extension at Kansas State University. I'm Jeff Wickman, and this is the K-State Radio Network.